You may or may not be aware of this very eye-opening leaked information from Canada, which seems to provide a roadmap for the next phase of the COVID agenda into 2021. I haven't personally been able to verify the authenticity of this information. Nevertheless, the reason I'm going to cover it today is because at least some of it is certainly plausible given the trajectory we appear to be heading in globally and given what we know about the UN Agenda 21, 2030 and the World Economic Forum's Great Reset Plans. I'll let you make up your own mind as to what you think of this article. It's from CanadianReport.ca. Dear, and the name has been removed, I want to provide you some very important information. I'm a committee member within the Liberal Party of Canada. I sit within several committee groups, but the information I am providing is originating from the Strategic Planning Committee, which is steered by the PMO. I need to start off by saying that I'm not happy doing this, but I have to. As a Canadian, and more importantly, as a parent who wants a better future not only for my children, but for other children as well. The other reason I am doing this is because roughly 30% of the committee members are not pleased with the direction this will take Canada. But our opinions have been ignored, and they plan on moving forward toward their goals. They have also made it very clear that nothing will stop the planned outcomes. The roadmap and aim was set out by the PMO and is as follows. Phase in secondary lockdown restrictions on a rolling basis, starting with major metropolitan areas first and expanding outward, expected by November 2020. This sounds plausible to me, given that many world governments are considering a second lockdown, and in fact, at the time of making this video, Ireland has just been placed back into a second lockdown for six weeks. Rush the acquisition of, or construction of, isolation facilities across every province and territory, expected by December 2020. Daily new cases of COVID-19 will surge beyond capacity of testing, including increases in COVID-related deaths, following the same growth curves expected by end of November 2020. Complete and total secondary lockdown, much stricter than the first, and second rolling phase restrictions, expected by end of December 2020, early January 2021. Reform and expansion of the unemployment program to be transitioned into the Universal Basic Income program, expected by Q1 2021. We've of course been talking about universal basic income for quite a while now, so this also sounds plausible. Projected COVID-19 mutation and or co-infection with secondary virus referred to as COVID-21, leading to a third wave with much higher mortality rate and higher rate of infection expected by February 2021. This would be gravely concerning and might quickly stop any dissident movement in its tracks as the narrative would shift to COVID has mutated. Those crazy conspiracy theorists were wrong all along. It could be possible that dissidents would be scapegoated as the reason for the new outbreak. Also, could this be Pandemic 2 that Bill Gates has previously talked about? The idea of a, a bioterrorist attack is kind of the nightmare scenario because they're a pathogen with a high death rate would be picked. Now, the good news is, okay. I'm not trying to depress you, it's tough enough Too late. right now. Too that late. Most of the work we're going to do to be ready for pandemic two, I, I call this pandemic one, most of the work we'll do to be ready for that are also the things we need to do uh, to minimize the threat of, of bioterrorism. Uh, so we, you know, we'll have to prepare for the next one. That, you know, I'd say is, uh, will get attention this time. Uh, so we, you know, we'll have to prepare for the next one. That, you know, I'd say is, uh, will get attention this time. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, I'd say is, uh, will get attention this time. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, I'd say is, uh, will get attention this time. Mm -hmm. That will get attention this time. It's incredible that he could say that and not be challenged on it. 
What do you mean by that, Bill? Do you know something that we don't? How do you know what viruses are coming next? And why are you smiling about this? A new, more deadly virus released in the next few months would be a major blow to the resistance movement, in my opinion, and would likely cow the general public back into further submission to government mandates. Daily new cases of COVID-21 hospitalizations and COVID-19 and COVID-21 will exceed medical care facilities' capacity, expected Q1 to Q2 2021. Enhanced lockdown restrictions, referred to as third lockdown, will be implemented. Full travel restrictions will be imposed, including inter-province and inter-city, expected Q2 2021. Transitioning of individuals into the Universal Basic Income Program, expected mid-Q2 2021. That's a lot sooner than I would have expected. Projected supply chain breakdowns, inventory shortages, large economic instability expected late Q2 2021. Deployment of military personnel into major metropolitan areas, as well as all major roadways, to establish travel checkpoints, restrict travel and movement, provide logistical support to the area, expected by Q3 2021. So far, this sounds pretty much what I had anticipated was going to happen, but the timescale seems a little premature. This all seems way too fast, in my opinion. But it is possible that the globalists are accelerating their plans, given that they really aren't encountering as much resistance as they probably thought they would. This next part is where things get really heavy. Along with that provided roadmap, the Strategic Planning Committee was asked to design an effective way of transitioning Canadians to meet an unprecedented economic endeavour, one that would change the face of Canada and forever alter the lives of Canadians. What we were told was that in order to offset what was essentially an economic collapse on an international scale, that the federal government was going to offer Canadians a total debt relief. This is how it works. The federal government will offer to eliminate all personal debts, mortgages, loans, credit cards, etc., which all funding will be provided to Canada, by the IMF under what will become known as the World Debt Reset Program. In exchange for acceptance of this total debt forgiveness, the individual would forfeit ownership of any and all property and assets forever. The individual would also have to agree to partake in the COVID-19 and COVID-21 vaccination schedule, which would provide the individual with unrestricted travel and unrestricted living, even under a full lockdown, through the use of photo identification referred to as Canada's Health Pass. This is basically what we've suspected all along, although I did not anticipate an individual debt forgiveness program. We've known about health passports like COVID Pass, Common Pass, and the Health Passport Ireland for some time now. We've also known that they have wanted to introduce a world where we couldn't travel, work, go to the shops, without being involved in a digital beast system. Essentially, it's join the population control network or get left behind, become a pariah cut off from basic services and cut off from the ability to buy food or have a job or any kind of life, really. You'll be on the fringes of society. No vaccine passport, no life, basically. Gaining access to public buildings, shops, businesses, public transport will require a person to be vaccinated and to display their vaccine status using the app on their phone upon entry into the premises. This means the end of privacy and freedom, and the face masks were the first mandate that served as a slow grooming process of the general public. Bribing people with debt forgiveness would make sense given that we know the IMF has offered bribes to other nations to impose lockdowns and tighter controls, Belarus, of course, being a nation that rejected such an offer. I could imagine here in Ireland that by the first quarter of 2021, it's likely that most small to medium businesses on the high street and around the country will be completely shuttered permanently, which, of course, was the point of lockdowns and restrictions to begin with, to make them unworkable to destroy all SMEs and force 99% of people into poverty and state dependence on welfare. The government will then transition from welfare to universal basic income, which essentially makes everyone in the country a kind of employee of the government. And then the government can determine whether you get paid or not based on your level of compliance with their authority. The universal basic income 
will likely be incorporated eventually into a cashless society. We'll be told cash has to be phased out in order to stop the spread of COVID. We're already starting to see more and more businesses no longer accepting cash. The globalists have wanted a cashless society for decades. That's not a secret. I've covered this story over the past couple of years. Apparently, COVID sticks to banknotes and coins, but not to things like bank cards, paper receipts, and newspapers. The fact that Joe Normie can't see this blatantly obvious agenda just goes to show that the public school system must be designed to reduce intelligence. With a cashless society, your bank account gets reduced to little more than a kind of PayPal account. Many of you probably know what it's like to get suspended on social media for posting something edgy or critical of the dominant mainstream narrative. Now apply the same kinds of super-sensitive, politically biased terms of service and community guidelines of a major social network like Twitter or Facebook to your bank. Imagine your bank suspending you for several days because you said something they didn't like on social media or at a political protest or because the social credit surveillance state detected that you broke the lockdown restrictions or didn't wear a face mask in public. They may even suspend you permanently. Whatever the reason might be, your funds could be suspended. Access to your money could be temporarily cut off for a few days in order to pressure you into compliance and prevent further dissent. So I'll continue with the article. Committee members asked who would become the owner of the forfeited properties and assets in that scenario and what would happen to lenders or financial institutions. We were simply told the World Debt Reset Program will handle all of the details Several committee members also questioned what would happen to individuals if they refused to participate in the World Debt Reset Program or the Health Pass or the vaccination schedule. And the answer we got was very troubling. Essentially, we were told it was our duty to make sure we came up with a plan to ensure that would never happen. We were told it was in the individual's best interest to participate. Well, it sounds very ominous. When several committee members pushed relentlessly to get an answer, we were told that those who refused would first live under the lockdown restrictions indefinitely, and that over a short period of time, as more Canadians transitioned into the debt forgiveness program, the ones who refused to participate would be deemed a public safety risk and would be relocated into isolation facilities. Once in those facilities, they would be given two options – participate in the debt forgiveness program and be released, or stay indefinitely in the isolation facility under the classification of a serious public health risk and have their assets seized. Sound like concentration camps or gulags to me. As it currently stands, it is very unlikely in my view that the public would consent to a total loss of private property rights, unless of course the economic crash leads to staggering, devastating levels of global poverty and is coupled with the possible threat of starvation due to the breakdown in international supply chains. Many countries, including my own, can't really feed their populations without global supply chains. It is, however, inevitable that private property would be another major target of this agenda. After all, communists always want to take away private property rights. Remember that World Economic Forum article from 2016? Welcome to 2030. I own nothing, have no privacy, and life has never been better. This article is in the category of Global Agenda and the Fourth Industrial Revolution, and it basically gives a glimpse into what looks like a dystopian outcome of the Agenda 2030 Sustainable Development Goals Plan. In this future, people don't own their homes. Everything they use, including right down to their kitchen utensils, are rented on a subscription model. They live in shared accommodation with strangers and make use of public transport and or self-driving electric cars. They are unable to venture outside of the city limits to the countryside, as these areas are deemed off-limits to human beings in order to maintain biodiversity and the natural environment, etc. The cities are all smart and maintained with mass surveillance. No one has any real freedom. Their towns and cities are also in compliance with the green agenda, streets are pedestrianized, and traffic congestion is non-existent, just as the lockdowns were designed to achieve. As we know by now, COVID, of course, was a smokescreen for pushing this green agenda. Anyway, by crashing the economy, making it so that people are unable to work, unable to pay their bills, loans, mortgages, 
and may in fact lose their homes, desperation may set in. This, of course, is another Hegelian dialectic. Create a major economic problem, a major collapse, generate mass panic, and then offer an economic solution with onerous terms and conditions and caveats. You'll be permitted to keep the roof over your head and to eat food so long as the roof over your head belongs to the globalist banksters and so long as you accept life as cattle in a digitally connected farm where you have no bodily sovereignty, vaccinated, tracked, monitored and controlled. Would people be willing to trade freedom and property rights for basic survival in a technocratic future? The destruction of all SMEs via lockdowns and unworkable social distancing policies has always been about eliminating the economic independence of the middle class and driving everyone down into poverty where they can be controlled. Also, by making those businesses unworkable, it massively drives down property prices and then all of those buildings and units on the high street can be bought up for pennies on the dime. This has always been a massive wealth transfer. Only massive global corporations that are already on side with the New World Order will survive and they will enjoy a significant monopoly, especially in an increasingly digital online age. The article continues. So, as you can imagine, after hearing all of this, it turned into quite the heated discussion and escalated beyond anything I've ever witnessed before. In the end, it was implied by the PMO that the whole agenda will move forward no matter who agrees with it or not that it won't just be Canada, but in fact all nations will have similar roadmaps and agendas, that we need to take advantage of the situations before us to promote change on a grander scale for the betterment of everyone, the members who were opposed and ones who brought up key issues that would arise from such a thing were completely ignored. Our opinions and concerns were ignored. We were simply told to just do it. All I know is that I don't like it and I think it's going to place Canadians into a dark future. Regardless as to the authenticity of the information here, we have predicted something similar to this over the past few months. We know how hellish and dystopian the Great Reset and the Fourth Industrial Revolution could turn out to be. We're already living in a nightmarish New World Order as it is. No human contact, no love, no hugs, no hobbies, no handshakes, no leisure pursuits, no public gatherings, no family get-togethers, no parties, no pubs, no concerts, no spontaneity in life, no meaning, no joy, no smile, no hope, no point. This is intolerable, and it's designed to be intolerable. As Justin Barris pointed out in his speech, if there's someone in your life who keeps making you miserable, that might actually be their intent all along. But there is something you must consider. As dark as things may seem, I believe that we've been given a gift, those of us who can see at least. It's an ability to see the truth And there has never been a greater privilege to be on the side of all that is good, righteous, and beautiful in this life. All that is meaningful. We get the opportunity to stand against the darkest, most powerful, insidious, satanic, and psychotic evil that humanity has ever faced. We should see this as an honor and a privilege, because the quality of life, and indeed human life itself, is under such attack There has never been a better time to truly be alive in every sense of the word because life and the value of truly living it to its fullest has never been more important, more precious, and more worthy of appreciation and protection. Most of humanity all over the world does not understand or realize that the very essence of being human is under attack. To truly be human is to be free to be exactly who and what we are and to live as freely as we possibly can with each other, accepting all of the risks that come with being in the world and of the world. Those of us who see the truth have been called to defend this, no matter what the costs to ourselves, and no matter how difficult the challenge may be. There is no higher a responsibility, and no cause more noble. The challenge is so tremendously great because it is so worthwhile.